And so you saw this rush for, you know, fur trapping in Russia. You saw it over, go over um, in, the, in, in America as well. So some of these fur traders and some of these militias went and defeated a lot of the indigenous tribes over there and uh, spreading the, the Russian territories that way. You also saw an influx of Eastern Orthodox Christian missionaries that were also moving into the territory and converting locals. And by about 1639, um, Russian reach had reached all the way east into the Pacific Ocean. And then explorations continue that a lot, again, a lot of it um, motivated by fur trapping expeditions so you saw the russians uh, expeditions into alaska in 1741 and along the western coast of north america um, all the way down to california by 1814 so you can see their exploration and spread is just exploding here in the 16 17 and into the 1800s now let's go ahead and move on to east asia um, specifically with china so last time we left china was uh, with the Mongol invasion and occupation of China. Now, this was is known as the Yuan Dynasty, and it was founded by Kublai Khan, who was a grandson of Genghis Khan, who took over China um, after the Mongols had been fighting for many decades and officially took over the Song Dynasty and established the Yuan Dynasty. So this happened uh, in 1271, and then just under 100 years later, it was uh, in turn overthrown by a Chinese group um, known as the Ming, or beginning the Ming Empire, which means the sort of bright or brilliant empire. Now, the Ming Empire will stabilize East Asia for Chinese control for the next about 300 years. It's also at this time that Europeans started showing up and seeking trade access with China as well. So they entered, um, Portuguese came in first, and then other Europeans uh, arrived afterwards. And then uh, the Ming Empire was overthrown. Uh, the Ming Empire was overthrown by a group just north um, known as the Manchu in what's called Manchuria. And in 1644, they overthrew the Ming Dynasty and established the Qing Dynasty, which is going to also last about 300 years and is interestingly the final Chinese dynasty. Um, after they will be overthrown, um, you get the birth of the Republic of China. So this will be the um, ending the dynastic cycle of China, which had lasted um, about two and a half thousand years. Okay, and then also, um, I'm not gonna spend as much time in this unit on Japan and Korea, but Japan and Korea will also see developments of their own and parallel um, the the development of China um, at this time as well um, with with China in 1600 you get the uh, the sort of um, centralizing of Japanese power under the Tokugawa but that'll be a story for another time but that also brings a very powerful age for Japan as well so the Ming Empire um, is generally controlling this area that you see here this is the Ming Dynasty around 1580 so somewhere around their height The Manchus came from up north, kind of up in this uh, northern region here. So they came in, brought in their, their language, their writing characters. So um, the Ming Empire was all about, okay, so they, they took over the, 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 um, the, the, or drove out the Mongols and were really trying to restore China back to being uniquely China. Um, if you remember one of the previous lessons too, some of the things that the Ming did specifically was um, they rebuilt and expanded to its greatest lengths and fortifications, the Great Wall. Um, you know, the Mongols had left such a bad taste in their mouth that they wanted to end, to try to end these attacks from northern nomadic or northern uh, peoples. So the Great Wall, by the way, that you see today is mostly a Ming creation. Um, although the Great Wall had existed for over 1,500 years before this, it did not really look in the form that it does now. It used to be more of like a wood and earthen kind of uh, affair, but really the stone thicker fortifications were really a Ming thing. But even with that, it still was un they were still unable to keep out northern groups like the Manchus or others. Um, so the Great Wall maybe deterred people at times, but it never fully protected China from the north ever. But anyway, so the Ming, um, yeah, drove out and tried to kind of return China back to China. Another interesting thing about the Ming is um, early on, they were into foreign exploration. That was with like the great explorer and navigator Zheng He, as you saw, who were completely dominating the seas of the world really at this time, but ended that as a new regime in the Ming wanted to totally focus on their own internal um, issues, right? Like trying to defend themselves against Northern, you know, attackers. So um, they kind of turned their tune for that. But again, they were taken over by the Qing dynasty and 
they will continue on that way. So um, just going back to the Ming. So here is the map. But uh, some of the ideas is the Ming Dynasty definitely expanded the size of China. Um, they conquered Mongolia, kind of going back here. So kind of the Mongol region over here. Um, they end up conquering into there. And uh, however, Mongol armies did reconquer it. So they, they just going back had conquered some of this region. Uh, the Mongols took it back and actually for a time imprisoned the Ming Emperor. Um, so it's tumultuous times with the Mongols continued on for a long time. That really kind of characterizes the Ming experience. But like I said before, um, Chinese leaders restored and expanded the Great Wall um, to help keep out invaders from the north, but didn't largely do that. Now the kind of um, peak kind of here as we're moving into the, the Qing dynasty here, um, Emperor Changxi, he uh, presided over kind of, one of the biggest periods of stability and, and expansion. Um, um, at this time period. So also incorporating Taiwan, again, Mongolia, kind of taking that back, Central Asia, Tibet. So you see that um, being um, uh, expanded to. Sorry for the kind of the cutoff, if it's kind of cutting off that last line. but And then you see um, some... Another emperor, the rule to, to look at is Emperor Qianlong. So he ruled from 1736-1796, a very, very long rule here, and was an intellectual. Um, he was a poet, uh, very knowledgeable in arts and calligraphy, and really uh, expanded that and, and kind of um, pushed that in, in the empire here. Uh, Chinese administration and tax collections were basically at an all-time successful high under him um, here in the Qing. And... He also um, initiated a lot of military campaigns uh, west of China. So he annexed uh, um, Xinjiang and was also known for some brutal mass killings of local populations. Now, as they expanded west, they also were getting into Islamic territories. So what you end up getting was um, an incorporation or, or, uh, or at least attempted or uh, definitely a takeover of a Muslim population known as the Uyghurs, who are now going to be kind of controlled by the Chinese, but culturally never really were incorporated into to Chinese culture. So China is becoming uh, multi-ethnic at this time. Um, he also is responsible for installing uh, the Dalai Lama on the throne in Tibet um, and also was successful against Nepal. However, uh, Qing uh, military expansions were unsuccessful down in Southeast Asia and Burma and Vietnam, which has always been a region that the Chinese have struggled to incorporate. Okay, so Qing Dynasty looks a lot more basically like the China you see today. Basically, the borders of the China you see today are a result of Qing conquest. So it's the largest they had ever been. And But yes, you're going into some of these more Central Asian um, parts, like we were talking about where the Uyghurs live and some of these Western parts. Also, some really important trade cities along the Silk Road, like Kashgar, for example, um, are being controlled here. So you see the largest extent of any Chinese dynasty at this time. But yeah, this is about 1765 here. All right, so the Qing Dynasty um, at this time was, again, very militaristic, right? And this also influenced them loosening some policies a little bit to allow for European traders because they needed funds for these conflicts that they, military conflicts they were having in the West. So what they did is started to sell limited trading privileges to European powers and were very, very limited. Um, for example, they basically only opened up one trading port for um, the Europeans and that's in what today is Canton. And there were a lot of restrictions. Um, they uh, basically, you were not, these Europeans were not allowed to stay full time in, in, uh, in, Canton here. They basically there was a trading season. You could come in, but you had to leave. You were constantly being monitored by Chinese government officials, um, very restrictive about what could be traded and that sort of thing. So it was ex yeah, extremely strict that way. And the British and other nations were not very satisfied with this. And specifically, the British uh, were asking for more trade rights well, with the Emperor Qianlong. And basically, and this kind of sums up the Chinese relationship early on with traders, which was the emperor told like King George back in back in um, back in Britain that China had no need for British goods, which is totally true. China is the manufacturing power of the world and makes high quality goods, way higher than any quality of any goods probably coming out of Europe. And basically said, we have no need for your goods. 
right? Um, they'll take their money, they'll take those things, but they're not really interested in that. Now, later on, of course, you'll find that the British tried to find other ways to, to trade, and um, that was especially with opium, uh, where that will come in and they will kind of sneak that into uh, into China. And that becomes sort of a trade thing, but not something that um, the Chinese at least liked, but was heavily popular because a lot of people became addicts um, with that too. So that it gets more into the Opium Wars, which is a story for another time. All right, and then kind of lastly here, wrapping up with East Asia. Um, over time... Uh, later in the in the reign of Chang'ong, uh, you started to see the Chinese bureaucracy become a lot more corrupt. Um, uh, mismanagement of money, misappropriation of things, levying high taxes that really start to become a point of contention amongst their people that wanted to basically overthrow that. And when you started to see this was some from uh, formalized rebellions here. Okay, uh, One of the most famous ones here was the White Lotus Rebellion, which you can see the dates here. So kind of the end of the 1700s, early 1800s, led by peasants. And what they actually wanted to do was drive out the Manchus, who again, the Chinese view is a foreign people. Kind of like how they viewed the Mongols, a foreign group, and wanted to restore who they thought were the legitimate rulers of China, which was the Ming Dynasty. Now, the Qing uh, government and the Qing military brutally suppressed this uprising. It's estimated that probably 100,000 peasants were killed in this, so they were able to uh, fend that off. But the devastation of these... Um, of these rebellions is also going to definitely weaken the Qing Empire. And what you will see um, also influence at this time is more and more European influence, kind of taking advantage of a lot of this instability right here. Okay, with that, you kind of get the context for this time period. And now we're going to put right on top of that the main focus of this lesson today, which is on the rise of the Islamic gunpowder empires. The Ottoman Empire, the Safavid Empire, and the Mughal Empire. So uh, there are some shared traits. Now, one of the key features, of course, is that they are Islamic empires. But after that, there's a lot of difference. But here are some other things. Um, they all have a common dissension, which is they descended from uh, Turkish nomads that came out of Central Asia. So they do have a common origin point. They spoke a sort of uh, Turkic style language. So there are some commonalities linguistically there. And what they all definitely did was filled power vacuums that when the Mongol Khanates broke up, that these empires ended up failing. And then the big course key feature that gave them so many successes is these are some of the earliest gunpowder militaries. Um, they use gunpowder weapons such as artillery and cannons, which is what gave them their military success over other powers. So, rewinding these empires back, you come back to this origination and we were talking about these these turkic uh um, this turkic influence they come right here from a conquer ruler named tamerlane or timur the lame as he was often called um so he uh they invaded out of central asia and he was of a mongol turkic ancestry as many people were in central asia at this time and the turkic empires that are going to follow really um come from this influence right here so his army was uh, partly composed of nomadic warriors as well as sedentary ones um, from all across kind of the eurasia um, uh, geography there and uh, established capital in Samarkand, as you know, is a powerful, powerful Silk Road city and location there, and was known for some ruthless conquests of Persia and for India. So um, what really kind of came into being here under Tamerlane was this, this uh, concept called the Ghazi Ideal. And basically, this was the model for warrior life under these sort of Turkic empires. Um, so under, and under, you know, uh, Tamerlane. So what it did is it, bla it basically blended these cooperative values of nomadic culture. Nomadic culture is huge about cooperation. It's how these groups survive. They cooperate with each other. But then also citing that with identifying oneself as a holy fighter for Islam. You're fighting for your beliefs. You are fighting for your gods. So you have this Islamic ideal that is also um, underlying this. So this is going to serve basically as the model for warriors of all three gunpowder empires. So this is really established there, what it is to sort of be one of these people. Cooperative values and um, um, Islamic, uh, Islamic influence.
Okay, so to continue on with Tamerlane, so he had a violent takeover of Central Asia, um, for example, including the massacre of probably 100,000 Hindus, um, kind of before the gates of, of, of Delhi here in um, northern India. And although kind of similar with anyone, it seems like if anybody of uh, some kind of Mongol connection, you have this uh, this interesting balance in a way of incredible violent um, brutality and then also encouraging um, other things, though, like learning in the arts. So uh, he was very much yeah into arts and, and culture and architecture and you see some of the survive the brilliant surviving architecture in samarkand uh, today with some of the the buildings that uh, were made under this time period but uh, one of the big things again that uh, had him or helped him stand out and his empire um, was or his group was um, the use of gunpowder for military or for the military with heavy artillery and as somebody that understood the importance of Central Asia in the world economy, um, went to extensive lengths to protect the land routes of the Silk Roads, similar to what the Mongols had done before him. So Tamerlane's empire um, didn't last very long, but nevertheless conquered a quite a large region of into the Middle East, Central uh, Central Asia, and starting to creep in across the Indus River um, and into into India here. So you can see, yeah, this won't be long lasted, and you can see where kind of they they derive out of the um, kind of capital here in in Samarkand um, with an empire. But again, what you're going to have break off here is three empires eventually. You're going to get the Ottomans. They're going to come out here in the west, in the central here, the Safavids, and then branching out from this kind of steps of what would be at modern day Afghanistan into India will be the Mongol Empire. So you can see, or sorry, the Mongol Mughal Empire, and you can see their origination here. This is about 1405, by the way. All right, now, just to finish up with Tamerlane, um, he did fail to leave an effective political structure basically after he died in his conquered areas. That's why it's going to break up. Um, one thing that definitely hurt them was how expensive these conquests were, and their economy was in shambles. So you get, again, out of this kind of um, uh, branching of different groups, and that's where we're going to jump into right now. So let's start with the Ottoman Empire. We'll kind of go from west to east here. So um, the Ottomans, by about 1500... Um, we're extending today into modern-day Turkey, um, southeastern Europe with the Balkans, um, heading towards Central Europe, and we'll talk about this, and parts of North Africa as well as Southeast Asia, so basically spreading in all directions. Of all the Islamic empires, uh, this will be the largest one and most enduring, as it lasted for a good 500 years or so, long-lasting last, uh, lasting, um, the other uh, Islamic empires. And uh, was uh, founded by Osman and the Osman family dynasty um, in the 1300s. So they had started, again, as a smaller group um, of Central Asian origin and moved its way west into Turkey, which is really where people usually think of the centralization of the Ottoman Empire as kind of in modern-day Turkey. But that's actually not where they originated. Now, they lasted, of, again, of all the empires, they lasted the longest and into very close to the modern empire or the um, um, modern world. And in fact, lasting until basically World War One, um, the Ottoman Empire, if you know, was one of the major powers of World War One. And when this um, this alliance was defeated in 1918, um, not long after that, the Ottoman Empire was dissolved. So it lasted for basically yeah, over 600 years, was the most enduring and successful of all the Islamic empires. So again, we're talking at their height. The Ottoman Empire had expanded. Um, all of uh, starting um, again, probably in in more of this region over here in the east, and moving into modern day Turkey, uh, took over Mesopotamia, um, the took over Egypt and the Nile River, basically the entire northern coast of Africa, and then moving northwest into all of um, Turkey, and uh, what would be Turkey today, and then the Balkan Peninsula um, as well. So getting into Greece and into some of these other southeastern Asian territories. So you can see a little bit there around most of the Black Sea, uh, at least half of the Mediterranean, uh, the Red Sea, Nile, um, down to the Persian Gulf. So um, a large empire at its height. But of course, will change um, slowly over time and, and reduce in size over time. All right. So a lot of times the Mongol or sorry, the, the Ottoman uh, story and really kind of the, the, the real 
big lasting kind of event that really shows the Ottomans into being a world power was under Mehmed II, or Mehmed the Conqueror, as he's often called here. And that was because he is the one, and is at the Ottoman Empire, that finished off the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire, again, and uh, under what's often called the Byzantine Empire, which is the eastern half of Rome that survived the fall of western Rome, had been in control of Constantinople in this region for the last thousand years. And this is the official end, sort of, of the Romans here. So the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 is also one of the big reasons why uh, time periods are often broken up at 1450, uh, because this is going to be a massive movement, or sorry, a massive event that's going to change world history. And we're going to talk more about that when we start talking about exploration. But in a nutshell, basically what had happened here is um, the uh, Europe as a whole had connected through the Eastern world through Byzantine control of Constantinople and the Middle East and had direct access, of course, with that. Now, with the hostilities that came with the the takeover of um, Constantinople by the Ottoman Empire, this influenced Europeans to seek their own direct access to Asia. So it's not really surprising that within a generation of the fall of Constantinople, you saw Europeans making their uh, their inaugural voyages to Asia. So you start to see the... the um, efforts of people like Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus to find direct access to, um, to Asia. And then, of course, you're going to see the domino effect that's going to be created by these European um, explorations leading to colonization. So um, that is a big moment that will be definitely talked about more. But a little bit about the fall of Constantinople. Constantinople was probably the most fortified city on the planet and had been so for a long time. They had basically three tiers of walled fortifications that had withstood the attacks of people for a millennia. Um, but again, the big difference is this is the gunpowder empire. So what they were able to do, the Ottoman Empire, is, or Ottoman empire was able to do that others was use of a cannon bombardment with giant cannons. They had, for example, some cannons that were 26 feet you know, long, uh, but many of them 15 to 22 uh, foot cannons. And these would just bombard the stone walls, which again had held for a thousand years. Now, over the siege of months of the city, um, eventually it will be taken over. And uh, the Ottoman Empire will now control what might be the most important city, honestly, on the planet. Because Constantinople is what connects all of the routes that connect Asia, Europe, and Africa. Um, it truly is... Uh, um, one of the most important cities that has ever existed. They will also change the name to Istanbul. So you will not find Constantinople on a map, which you will see as Istanbul, which it remains today. And again, the city will continue to be used as a nexus of all global trade, um, connecting the Black Sea with the Mediterranean and then the land routes from west to east. Let me just look this up real quick. Okay. Actually, I actually want to show these pictures first. I had a slide out of order. But yeah, the uh, Ottoman Empire showed up, you know, to, to Constantinople with some of their large cannons and a very large successful army. And the siege began and took uh, many months of constant, constant bombardment. As again, they were showing up here. Now again, these cannons were bronzed, by the way, and would have possibly looked something like this. Um, they would have been pulled in by... Extensive use these have been so heavy with a huge basically gun caravan cannon caravans But again imagine something like this being used and months of constant bombardment that are just shredding apart the uh, multiple walls um, Interior walls of Constantinople. So this is what Led to the end of the Roman Empire right here. You're, you're kind of looking at it right now. <laughs> But the uh, Siege of Constantinople is one of the most famous battles in history as it was done by land and then also through the um, in the in the in the strait here of water. Um, the uh, naval force being assembled here by the Ottomans as well. So you can see, yes, naval battles as well as on land battles. Uh, basically, Constantinople was completely surrounded and didn't have much choice but to hang on as long as possible to those destroyed and starved out and uh, had to give up. Now what will of course be replaced too is the uh, there's kind of a changing of course from this city being a Christian haven into um, an Islamic one. 
Um, one of the features you saw, for example, with Mehmet was converting the most famous building in all of basically Christianity at this time, uh, the Hagia Sophia, and converting it into a mosque. So it uh, changed purposes. Um, they built the large minarets around, uh, around the Hagia Sophia. It's also one of the largest domed buildings, and this goes back um, uh, nearly millennia as well. Um, as uh, Constantinople was expanded by Justinian and, um, you know, others. But, yeah, so building this, building of the minarets as a part of worship in Islamic mosques. So the Hagia Sophia here um, will be converted into a mosque. Today, today it's actually been secularized um, because it is mostly served as a museum and a tourist destination as one of the most important architectural projects ever assembled um, or ever created not just as a dome but um, the the mix of christian and islamic culture and architecture and styles and purposes in it um, changed again hands multiple times and luckily for an architecture architectural standpoint the leaders that would con, con you know conquer and rule constantinople under or istanbul um, understood the importance of this building it's something that needs to be that needs to remain so very thankful that this you know was not destroyed let me go back to the slide I meant to do right after the pictures, and that was, sorry, this one. So, I'm um, continuing on there. Mehmed the Conqueror took over lands around the western edge of Black Sea, wanted to basically control all the Black Sea for its trade purposes, of course, and then move past Constantinople, going west um, into northwest, into the Balkans, and to southeastern Europe, um, where they will start to try to rival the Mediterranean trade power of Venice, which was a large, uh, most important and powerful of all the European trade kingdoms out there. And to do that, though, they had to strengthen their navy, of course, because so, they were trying to rival the Italian navy, which was the power, the naval power of the Mediterranean. Um, they were never able, though, to necessarily conquer Venice, but they were able to intimidate and basically require Venice to basically pay a tribute uh, by basically forcing them to pay a yearly tax. So that was the closest they really get to any kind of conquest, really, of, of Italy there. And in the early 16th century, you see them move into Africa. So into present-day Syria, into uh, Israel, into Egypt, and then in northern Africa around the regions of today's Algeria. Istanbul also became a major, major center of Islamic learning, um, especially after the Mamluk dynasty in Egypt had collapsed and you see um, you see really that shifting uh, into uh, instability becomes not only almost like the trade capital of the world but the uh, intellectual capital of the world as well but those were just the uh, pictures again take another look at them all right so with Mehmet really conquering the a uh, uh, large extent of what's going to be the the um, the Ottoman Empire, the peak of Ottoman influence really came under Suleiman, with his awesome giant mushroom hat right there, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, the Ottoman Empire really reached his peak, reached their peak under under him. Um, for example, they overran Hungary in 1526 and got the closest they ever did to really getting to the heart of Europe, um, reached the gates of Vienna, which was a major. Um, power center for eastern uh for kind of centralized europe um did fail though to take it they tried twice to take vienna um didn't work uh, did have some other successes military like their navy taking the island of Rhodes, which is what's today present-day greece which had for a long time been basically a stronghold for christian knights protecting uh the mediterranean there also went west and all the way to tripoli in north africa in the 1550s but um, like I was saying before, the Ottoman Empire will will eventually decline, um, kind of slowly, but definitely saw its peak in the 1500s. That was really the best century for the Ottoman Empire was the 1500s. Um, they had a lot of internal and external conflicts. Like I said before, it was officially dissolved within a few years um, after World War One, but had Ford invasions. Um, also, a lot of internal issues and reform movements that uh, they kind of struggled to kind of keep up with and try to at some times, but would definitely weaken their power. But that'll be more of a uh, story for the next unit. And some more of their, their fall. All right. That's going to conclude our talk about the Ottoman Empire. And now we're going to move on to a little bit east into a group called the Safavids or the Safavid Empire. So they are one of the um, um, unique groups. 
Okay, that that came from kind of a. Um, sorry, I should read a couple things. Um, but yes, they 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 came into conquering basically what would be uh, Persia at this time. And they're really, their start came under a sort of military leader, a military hero, if you will, called Ishmael, who was really the founder of the Safavid Empire. And he came in, conquered from a little bit north into Persia and pulled into Iraq. Uh, when he took the city of Tabriz, who was proclaimed Shah, one of the unique features of the Safavids is they are a um, Shia empire. And Shia ruled, as the Ottoman Empire was largely Sunni. So you do see uh, a... Um, a difference there that will actually bring those two empires, as though Islamic, will be great enemies for a long time. So he proclaims himself Shah, or kind of, yeah, uh, Shah, which is the equivalent of a king or an emperor, sort of, as in, in kind of these Persian terms, in 1501. Safavid Empire, though, did have a couple issues early on, though. Um, one, they basically were a non-existent naval power, and as a centrally located um, group, had no natural defenses on all sides which is going to be very difficult that way. So this is what we're talking about. So they came in from kind of more of this northern part of what would be kind of Persia or Iran today, and then took over these areas with their kind of capital, their operating center um, out of Isfahan, which is where they will kind of um, um, conquer. And then we'll go down to the Strait of Hormuz and conquer this region, which connects the Persian Gulf with the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean. But that's what we're talking about right here in Central Asia. Yeah, big moment, goes in, captures the city of Tabriz, proclaims Shah after this time, and will start a Shia empire. The height of the empire, though, will be under Shah Abbas, or Abbas I, or also known as Abbas the Great, in the late 1500s and early 1600s. So this is the height of the empire. They were a military empire. Um, in fact, some of their uh, their recruits were from these Christian boys that were enveloped into their empire that were pressured into service, um, into a form of service with them that often came from Georgia or Russia or uh, Russia today. Um, one thing they definitely did which helped them grow was imported European weaponry and also used European advice about how to use said weaponry and military advice with that. Um, one thing you saw here was definitely a control over religion and and politics. It became very much a um, almost like a theocracy in a way, and used Shia Islam. Right, um, Shia Islam is uh, is a smaller group. If you know, going back to um, to Islam, uh, most uh, Muslims are Sunni Muslims. Um, probably around, I believe, around 80, 85 percent. I think um, could be off by a little bit on that. But Shia Islam. Uh, serving as the other about 15 or so percent. And that goes back to the Sunni-Shia um, split, if you know about um, early time periods with Islam, um, originally derived from the succession of Muhammad, where there was a disagreement about who should basically be the successor or caliph, you know, or uh, yeah, successor to Muhammad. Should it have been somebody that was kind of chosen by the community or somebody that was chosen as a descendant of, 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 um, of Muhammad? And Sunnis went with uh, more of electing a you know someone close to him or elect a leader from the community where Shia thought that should come through um, a descendancy there and I believe the the Safavids kind of sought and try to try to get their their legitimacy by claiming a descendancy the, the what they saw was the true descendancy of Muhammad and use that again as a way to establish and, and try to uh, validate their power there. But because um, they basically were a, a Shia theocracy and denied any kind of place um, in, of legitimacy for Sunnis, this brought them into direct conflict with the Ottoman Empire. So you have two Islamic empires that were notorious for fighting each other and the borders between the two empires, which they shared, basically dependent on conquests of certain cities and places like that. In this region, too, in kind of um, where it's going to be Iraq and Iran, the Sunni-Shia hostility continues today, and um, you can see a lot of its origins going back this far. One of the conflicts that rose was not just of a, um, of a uh, religious 
okay, um, source, but also over control of overland routes. So they basically control parts of the Silk Road that go through them and try to basically flex their muscle against each other. For, so like, for example, the Ottomans uh, use trade embargoes and officially banning certain products. Like, for example, the Safavids were ones that were trying to spread um, and, and, uh, and trade silk, as we know has been a huge commodity and a huge profitable trade good along the Silk Roads. And the Ottomans tried to embargo um, and ban that Safavid silk trade, basically as a way to limit the power of their enemy, the Safavids. So they use this, it's like a trade war to to dom- try to dominate each other. A um, little bit note of the Safavid Empire when it comes to women. Um, you definitely saw a lot of, um, you know, maybe compared to a lot of others, um, a lot more submission of women. Um, they are very rarely mentioned in any Safavid histories. Um, however, we do know they did have some kind of role in participation of society. You saw in this time um, uh, also the veiling of women, which has become a standard practice in this region um, hence, uh, um, ever since. And the freedom of movement being very restricted as women in public were veiled um, when they were allowed to travel at all, um, when you know unaccompanied. But did have access to some rights by Islamic law, some kind of property inheritance, and for exa- and also uh, divorce if an extreme case can be brought forth. Okay, so we're going to move on now, um, though, to our final of the Islamic empires. And we're going to, by the way, we're going to talk more about the decline of these empires a little bit later. We're just kind of introducing them. The very last thing we'll do is look at the decline of each of them and kind of contrast those. All right, now we're going to move into the Mughal India. So they had come out of what today would be Afghanistan. Um, they were a descendant of Tamerlane, so they're a descendant of, you know, Mongols and these Turkic groups in 1520. So it was this dynasty was founded by um, the first Mughal emperor known as Babur. And uh, is going to, again, establish a dynasty that will reign in India um, for 300 years. It is basically the longest lasting, most successful foreign group that um, has been in India. Okay, The only thing to rival that of a foreign group that any success in India would be the British You know, later on. So they had a centralized government that was similar to Suleiman over in Turkey. So a little bit more similar to maybe what was going on with the Ottoman Empire than anything. And then what we saw was the real sort of golden age or so, if you will, of of the Mughal rule and really the standards being set by his grandson, Akbar. So Akbar is the one that uh, moved out of the Hindu Kush into the northern Indies uh, or Indus River and Ganges River plains with an army again that was um, combined a couple frightening things actually. One was cannons and cannon bombardment, but also war elephants. War elephants were really useful because those things could pull big giant cannons, you know, but they used, um, yes, a, a, a war elephant kind of um, regiment in their, in their army too. So they came in and conquered the um, Indogagnia plain up in the north and um, becomes probably at their time uh, in, in the Mughal Empire at their height was probably the richest empire in the entire world. Probably the richest empire in the entire world. And you'll see why here in a little bit. But again, this is establishing what's known as the Mughal Empire. And they are going to be over here. So they crossed the Hindu Kush Mountains, took over the Andes or Indus River um, Valley, as well as the Ganges River Plain. And then not all of, of um, India, but kind of most of it up here. Now, this also brings in an interesting dynamic, and that is this is an Islamic group that is going to rule over a Hindu majority. And one of the things that, that the um, Mughal Empire always had to do was try to balance that about how seriously are they going to impose islam on a largely non-islamic group now islam had the introduction of islam had predated of course the mughals but hindus had always been the majority now with akbar for example um akbar granted religious tolerance um of of in india there but later rulers were not so much um, later on we're going to talk about the the final of the 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 great sort of mughal emperors um Aurangzeb, who was a devout Muslim and sought to basically persecute Hindus. He brought in back the jizya tax, which is a, um, a, a tax on um, non-Muslims in a in a uh, Islamic kingdom. You know what I mean? But anyways, this is what we're talking about with the Mughal Empire right here. 
so they traded with overseas flourish, or <laughs> they flourished with overseas trade. Um, unlike China, by the way, they welcomed European traders. Um, Vasco da Gama and the Portuguese, when they came in, they basically originally on saw no threat in granting Europeans trade access, which will come back to sort of bite them as, you know, Europeans started to push more and more into India and undermining Mughal authority. Uh, because, again, when early on when the Europeans showed up, they did not look like much of a threat. But, of course, throughout the decades, uh, they become more and more forceful and will, uh, again, chip away at some of the uh, Mughal authority there. But they sought that these people had money, especially once the Europeans start getting involved in the Americas and starting to get gold and silver. Um, the Mughal Empire was very interested in trading for money. Again, kind of like China, too. India is not seeking any goods from Europe, they're seeking cash, and they're very willing to uh, trade their very, very profitable goods, things like textiles, tropical foods, spices, of course, precious stones were exchanged for gold and silver, and that is what made, um, and their open trading policies made the Mughal Empire the most, uh, the wealthiest empire on the planet at this time. Now, since they also, the Mughal Empire is ruling over Hindu majority, they've also inherited a social structure, the caste system, which of course has been around for, um, by this time, for millennia. And what also happened is with the new introduction of wealth into India and expansion of a merchant class, you started to see the development of the subcastes or jatis. And jatis were kind of these castes within castes. And where that really started to spring up was among... Um, the merchant class, kind of the, the vices, I believe, uh, as part of the caste system there. So the caste system, again, is already in full effect. And they basically just, rather than with the modern world coming in, uh, like abolishing the caste system, they basically adapted it to be more economically flexible. But you still had the major categories with the top, the Brahmins, who are the priests of society, the Kshatriyas, which are your nobles and your warriors, the vices, which is your merchant class. And this is the group that is going to explode. Um, at this time and really become powerful and then the shudras who are the peasants now one of the big features that people talk about with the the caste system is those that are not born into those castes because your social group uh, you are born into it you do not achieve it you do not move into one you can't change social groups it's part of this um, also the marriage between the caste system as a social construct but also as a religious one with spiritual differences um, that you're born into which played into the reincarnation and kind of um, karma role that hindu religion has had but anyways then you also had the untouchables as you know those that were um, outside of that uh, caste system who had very restrictive livelihood but the caste system remember too is also very much the basis about what kind of educational and work opportunities you get your careers are basically decided by your um by your caste that you were, were born into. But where again, where you really saw things change was the Vaisya class, which is the merchant class, which really started to diversify uh, with the success of the economic trading under the Mughal Empire. One of the you know um, things that you found uh, with the architectural and our artistic achievements that came from basically all the silver that was just filling up the vaults of the Mughal Empire, again, making them the wealthiest uh, empire in the world and you saw that with projects like the Taj Mahal so Taj Mahal was built by the Emperor Shah Jahan who um, built it for his uh, his favorite wife I think he had I forget how many wives um, a lot this was common amongst these um, Islamic rulers but uh, his uh, favorite wife Muntash I forget, I think that was her name she died uh, giving birth to I honestly want to say I think it was like her th like thirteenth child or something. Uh, she had died into childbirth and it completely ruined him. And where he found solace was building the Taj Mahal, which is a tomb for her. It is often considered one of the most beautiful buildings ever made. And as a, a historical perspective, um, what people like to appreciate with this is its uh, blending of the uh, of of Hindu and um, local Indian art styles with the Islamic art styles. Um, that you'll see with like the minarets or something like that. So this was a project that he tried to find solace in in the rest of his life. Now, interestingly, I don't believe he actually was able to firsthand get to see the completion of it. Um, his son, Aurangzeb, who I've brought up before, actually imprisoned him and basically imprisoned him um, 
a ways and I think maybe gave him a, like a window out of his prison cell that he could see it but never actually get to it, which has been seen as one of the tragic stories. Now, Rangzeb is also um, one of the people largely responsible for the fall of the Mughal Empire because when he comes in, like I said before, he was a devout Muslim that wanted to impose Islam and uh, ends up being um, pers- uh, very much persecuting of local Hindus again. So this led to a lot of uprisings and rebellions that weakened the Mughal Empire, which I will show you again a little bit later. <laughs> but let's go ahead and now get to the decline. Um, what caused the decline of these empires? So we're going to break them down again. The Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal empires. One thing that coincides with the um, decline of these empires was the growth of European states. European states, as they became wealthy from trade and also their colonization efforts across Africa and the Americas, um, you saw them on on an incline while these Islamic empires are going to be on a decline. Um, You also saw some of the other neighbors like Russia, you know, modernizing and reorganizing their army, uh, really modeling after the English, the French and and, uh, the Netherlands. And one of the big kind of criticisms in a way was the lack of modernization that happened in the Islamic empires as contrasted with these other Western ones that were um, heavily, heavily modernizing their politics, their military, their technology, everything. So kind of a failure to keep up in that way eventually hurts them in the end because basically all these groups will fall to Western powers. All right, let's break it down though. Um, like we said earlier, Suleiman really represented the height of the Ottoman Empire. The 1500s were the height of this empire for sure. And starting in 1571, after Suleiman died, you started to see forces defeat the Ottoman Empire. You saw the Spanish as well as the Venetians out of Italy were defeating them and defeating their navy, which basically ended them as a naval power. Not that they had a long-lasting naval power, but um, definitely had one for a while that, again, rivaled the Venetians. And the Ottoman navy was defeated um, at the Battle of the Ponto, which um, really hurt their efforts to control the Mediterranean and some of their sea connections that way. Also, after Suleiman, the empire fell to um, a bunch of weaker sultans. A sultan is an Islamic king. was the, the king of, of or emperor, sort of, of the Ottoman Empire. is known as a sultan. And none of them were nearly as efficient and successful rulers as Suleiman was. So they um, saw losses again to their increasingly strengthening European neighbors around them. Um, this empire was known in Europe as now a sick man, the sick man of Europe, um, as you will see with the decline, which again kind of kind of shows what's what's happening to them. Europe's growing, but Ottoman Empire in Europe is sinking and is sick. But yeah, sick man of Europe. Um, their successors, you know, to Suleiman, oft, often too were prone to internal conflicts. The power of the Sultan, of course, was an incredibly powerful position. And with uh, a lot of these um, Sultans having many wives and concubines, what you saw was they call these harem politics. The harem is kind of the, you know, the social background to the to the palace lifestyle of the sultans. And what you started to see was these efforts of these wives and concubines were basically trying to topple over each other to put their own children into a position that they could assume the throne of the Ottoman Empire. So you have these internal struggles. Interestingly, though, that those harem politics between these wives and concubines also resulted in women becoming very pop or sorry powerful behind the scenes of the Ottoman Empire. There's a lot of women that ended up kind of pulling the strings before this. Again, usually with the origination of trying to get one of their children onto the throne into the seat of the Ottoman Empire. But you do see this internal problems happening here. And then kind of just lastly here, um, a couple failed sieges marked a turning, a turning point. Their failed siege of Vienna up in uh, moving towards Central Europe in 1683 marked really a turning point. A lot of people consider this is the beginning of the end of the Ottoman domination of Eastern Europe. So again, by the late 1600s, they are starting to exit out of European um, um, presence there. And then... Moving into the 18th century, uh, or sorry, the, 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 into the 17th century as well, and into the ni- um, 18th and 19th, sorry, the se- seven, or, uh, sorry, 18th and 19th centuries, and into the 20th centuries, you see more involvement from these other powers. So you see the French and the British get a lot more involved. I'm definitely interested in trying to create more of a balance of power in in Europe. Uh, Greek independence in 1821 was a huge blow to, and kind of one of the final straws of of uh, 
of the Ottomans in uh, in Europe, and then the Russian expansion. Okay, in the 19th century, is going to further weaken them as they were trying to push themselves more into um, the Black Sea, which they wanted to do. You saw the expansion here of Russia under some um, um, couple rulers, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, which really sought to westernize and get uh, westernize Russia, which included trying to create direct water, warm water trading ports, which Russia did not have until the 1700s and into the 1800s. And, or yeah, into the 1700s there, um, when trying to control the Black Sea, which of course has direct access to Mediterranean and also has year long warm water ports. So they had shipped away at the Ottoman Empire for that kind of control. All right, moving on, what happened to the Safavid Empire? So they had definitely had ineffectual leaders after their peak years under Abbas the Great. You saw with the Safavid shahs and leaders um, lavish lifestyles and frivolous spending, both both in their lifestyles as well as military spending, which totally bankrupted their economy that way. I mean, not totally bankrupt, but weakened their economy. And then you started to see the whole idea of them trying to create this like Shia um uh, the Shia dominance with rebellions um, that were in largely in large part conducted by Sunnis, right? Because remember, uh, the the Safavids were Shias and had suppressed and and put down Sunnis, and rebellions started to bring up by Sunni Muslims in uh, present day Afghanistan. So you saw that um, Afghan forces end up sacking the capital Isfahan, and um, there they had a leader named Mahmud who declared himself Shah of all of Persia. So you can see an internal decline happening with them. Also, with their declining, um, with their decline both from the north and from the west. So from the Ottomans in the west and kind of the Russians in the north, they were able to chip away at parts of the empire and like um, and and lose that there. And then were eventually replaced by a group called the Zan Dynasty in 1760. All right, and then let's wrap up with the Mughal Empire decline. So I've brought up Aurangzeb. Um, he's seen as the final major ruler of the Mughal Empire, who inherited definitely a weaker empire. Um, there was a lot of corruption, uh, failure to keep. Uh, again, one of the big things was failure to failure to keep up with military innovations. Of their enemies, Europeans, are all over Europe now and are militarily defending themselves and trying to entrench themselves with. Uh, with with taking over port cities and that sort of thing, and their lack of military innovation um, is slowly hurting the Mughal Empire as well. He also hoped to increase the size of the empire, which did not work very well. Um, they wanted, and specifically the idea of trying to bring basically all of India under Islamic rule, which again is something that has been impossible for them because they are a, a uh, Muslim minority in a Hindu majority. Um, and that had always been very hard. So completely drained the empire's treasury, which is a saying a lot for what was the most wealthy empire on the planet, but drained a lot of the empire's treasury while trying to expand in the south. And then the the uprisings. Um, just one more time, his, his insistence on promoting an Islamic lifestyle um, ends up backfiring um, for sure. It was the grounds for a bunch of uh, rebellions that people were able to unify. Hindus, Sikhs, other groups in India were, were uh, rebelling and unifying and rebelling against um, his oppressiveness. Again, one of the things he tried to impose to try to convert people to Islam was the jizya, which is a tax that multiple Islamic empires have used. And that's basically when, and this happened in Africa, it happened in like Spain and, and in the Middle East, all over the place, which was imposing a tax on non-Muslims, which again, although did, was successful in converting people, was something obviously that non-Muslims were not very happy about no matter where you lived. And the instability that resulted from the um, from Aurangzeb and the loss of control by the Mughals was taken advantage of by the British and the French in the 1700s as they were able to undermine uh, Mughal um, authority and insert themselves more into more until eventually uh, India basically came down to the rule between the British and the French. And then what finally finished that off, though, of course, was the uh, Seven Years' War, which the British were able to defeat the French and establish their dominance over India. So... That'll be the, the further part of the decline here that happens um, after this time period. Or mark kind of the end of it. 1750 kind of marks the end of this unit, which also coincides with the Seven Years' War. So um, another reason why 1750 is a, is a, a, um, a somewhat more natural break for a, a, a time period that you can bring in with the Seven Years' War. Okay. 
And that's going to wrap it up here today. Let's just revisit our essential question. Our essential question was, how did certain land-based empires develop and expand in the period from 1450 to 1750? So now hopefully you're able to provide evidence that this was to become an essay question. And so you can now talk about, you know, specifically, you can bring up some of the land-based empires, again, that we have talked about. Um, specifically, you can definitely bring up the Turkic Islamic empires. You can now bring up the Ottoman Empire. You can bring up the Safavid Empire. You can bring up the Mughal Empire. And one of the things you're absolutely going to want to use as evidence of this was the development of gunpowder technology, as all of them use that to their advantage. Okay. But you also see the role of... Um, uh, Islam in the rule of these different groups too but anyways you are definitely going to go through as you study and try to find evidence of how these uh, empires developed and expanded and of course gunpowder is one of not only but one of the large things that helped these empires expand <laughs> all right awesome as we're wrapping up here, that concludes the uh, the the lesson here. Let's go ahead and look to the live audience um, for anything going on. We got a five dollar donation from Holy Omnissiah, who says, "Then the winged hussars uh, arrived." Right? People love talking about the winged hussars from um, Hungary over there because they're gonna insert themselves afterwards. So, if you are fans of them, their time is 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 uh, slowly coming. So. Thank you for the donation uh, to the channel right there. Holy Omnissiah from the uh, live audience. Okay, and with that, that will go ahead and conclude our lesson today. Keep up um, doing your studies. Uh, if you're now just reaching Unit 3, you're... Um, uh, now finishing up about the first third of the of the content there so keep on keeping on you're doing a great job um, always ask for help ask your teachers ask other people take control of your education whether you're a high school student you're a college student take control of your education okay there's help out there there's influence there's uh, there's um, a, a lot of things to help you out there so keep studying establish good routines ask lots of questions all right, just a few plugs on the way out. Um, if you would like to be a part of our historical community here at uh, Mr. Terry History, I invite you to join our Discord server. A link to our Discord server is down below. Um, I've also created in there a channel specifically for students, um, AP students, college students, wherever you're at, that you can interact with each other and get more updates there. Um, some other plugs just to support the channel. Let me join our Patreon. There's a Patreon account that supports um, uh, supports this channel here. This channel um, and my my lessons are of no charge, um, but people have you know sought out ways to try to um, thank that with some other donations. One way you can do that uh, is through Patreon. Um, one of the perks of also being a Patreon member is you get to access um, a weekly poll that I put up for uh, videos that get on uh, reaction videos that that get on this channel so I have a uh, currently set to people of all donation levels so that's one way you can support the channel as well other ways you can support the channel is um, through the live lessons or through live premieres if you want to financially support the channel you can do that through super chats which is great as well as donations through Streamlabs. Um, later on maybe try to get some other ways that you can support the channel is also mr terry history uh, Merchandise uh, that is up on Teespring. You can find that as well if you're looking way just to have some history themed stuff and to support the channel as well. But again, talked about the Discord channel. Definitely um, sign up for that. And the most important thing you can do is subscribe to this channel. Enable notifications definitely so you know when live lessons are going to happen and you know when live premieres are going to happen. Um, so definitely hope to see you around there. Thank you again for joining us here today. And I hope you learned a lot. Um, and keep on working hard with your uh, with your history. There's definitely help out there. You can do it. History is important, probably more important than you realize. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good day wherever you're at. We'll see you soon. Bye.